بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم ہیلو ایوری ون گڈ مارننگ گڈ آفٹر نون گڈ ایوننگ ویلکم ٹو ٹیچر ڈیولپمنٹ ویبنارس مائن ایم زمان اللہ سان آئی فیسلیٹیٹ ورچوئل پروگرامز ایٹ ٹیچر ڈیولپمنٹ ویبنارس Teacher Development Webinar is a social action project to support teachers and educators around the world with professional development opportunities. It is an initiative using the rise in online professional development to connect people from around the world with opportunities which they may not have had due to the all normal of face-to-face conferences. We are celebrating International Mother Language Day webinar series that aims to celebrate linguistic diversity and multilingualism. We intend to promote awareness of equity and inclusion in education through discussions about linguistic human rights, importance of mother tongues, and language sensitization, and other concerns about language. And now for this webinar, it's my privilege to introduce her, Professor Sarah Thompson. After receiving her PhD from the Yale University in 1988, Dr. Sarah Thompson taught Slavic linguistics at Yale. from 1968 to 1971, and then general linguistics at the University of Pittsburgh in, from 1972 to 1998. Since 1999, she has been at the University of Michigan, where she is now the Bernard Block Distinguished University Professor of Linguistics. Sara was chair of the linguistics department from 2010 to 2013. Her current research focuses on a context-induced language change, endangered languages, and Salishan linguistics, but she also has a continuing interest in debunking linguistic pseudoscience. A few of her publications are Language Contact, Serialization, and uh, Genetic Linguistics, published by University of California Press in 1998-1991, and uh, Language Contact and Introduction, published by uh, University of uh, Georgetown University Press in 2001 and Endangered Languages and Introduction published by Cambridge University Press in 2015 and others. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Sally, for being at Teacher Development Webinars. Welcome to Teacher Development Webinars. Thank you, Amanullah. Um, and thank you all for coming. Let me... Put some slides up. I hope you can see them. Um, yep. I want to start by thanking Amanullah and the Teacher Development Webinar Series uh, for inviting me. I'm honored to be uh, here uh, presenting uh, in honor of um, International Mother Language Day, so web webinar series. Um, I'm going to be talking about endangered languages, languages that are in danger of disappearing entirely, and about efforts to reclaim endangered languages, but mostly about how linguists can help, um, some about how they can't help. I'll talk about a few cases around the world, but I'll concentrate on my own uh, documentation, documentary work in two different contexts, uh, different ends of my career. Um, as illustrations of what linguists, how linguists can try to be useful to communities who are engaged in language revitalization. And then finally, a general conclusion. Uh, so in the year 2000, uh, there were around 7,000 languages still spoken in the world. And if you ask how many there will be by the end of the century, Pessimists might tell you about 700, optimists might say about 3,500, and either of those figures is depressing to somebody who appreciates and enjoys linguistic diversity. And that's not even counting endangered dialects, which are um, also very numerous, although counting those is a lot harder than counting languages, which isn't easy. Among countries where a lot of languages are spoken, uh, it's all too likely that some or even most of the minority languages will be endangered. Pakistan is a fairly typical example among its minority languages. Um, many of them are being replaced by Urdu and or Pashto, uh, the national, the most prominent national languages. Uh, and just to give you an illustration, uh, here's how UNESCO's Atlas of the World's Languages in Danger classifies 
uh, the 26 endangered languages of Pakistan. Seven of them are vulnerable, including the Dravidian language Brahui and the isolate with no known relatives, Burushaski. 13 are definitely endangered, six are severely endangered. There are none on the critically endangered list, according to the UNESCO Atlas, which is um, good news, but there are still a lot of endangered languages. And as I say, Pakistan is fairly typical of the world's um, uh, nations with a lot of languages. Here's just a couple of comments to set the stage uh, about language endangerment and death. The late great linguist Ken Hale said, when you lose a language, you lose a culture, intellectual wealth, a work of art. It's like dropping a bomb on the Louvre. Uh, the sentiment would be widely shared by linguists. Uh, and uh, language activists, Sergio Maldonado, uh, the Arapaho tribe in the United States, very succinctly put it uh, from the tribal view, you lose the language, you lose the soul. So when you ask whether threatened languages can be reclaimed, you won't find many undisputed long-term success stories. Modern Hebrew um, is really the only one that you can point to where a uh, previously endangered moribund even in some respects, language was revived to the point where it is the major language of a modern nation state. Uh, but although there aren't other examples like Hebrew, there are a lot of communities working very hard to revitalize their endangered languages and with, with considerable success, not replacing a previously dominant language in their environment, but at least reviving, resuscitating, revitalizing, reclaiming uh, their previously endangered language, or in the case of some of them, dormant languages, uh, to the point where they're used side by side in some daily contexts. Maori in New Zealand, Hawaiian in Hawaii, Wampanoag in the Eastern United States, Miami, Illinois in the Midwestern United States. And you find more reported every day. There are hundreds of websites devoted to revitalization of the threatened languages. Um, hmm. The uh, communities all over the world are proliferating. Uh, efforts are proliferating to save their languages. Uh, a few examples, Karuk in California in the United States with 10 to 12 fluent first language speakers, all of them elderly. They've instituted language classes in the public schools. There is the master apprentice program outside of school. I'll say a little more about that later. Uh, in Australia, uh, the Gumangir has 90, 90 speakers or had 90 speakers as of 2016. The uh, Murme Aboriginal Language and Culture Cooperative has um, engaged in documentation and development of teaching materials. Uh, Jejuo spoken on um, Jeju Island in Korea has few speakers, all of them elderly. There are positive attitudes toward the language. Uh, the Provincial Language Act of the province of Jeju is promoting Jejuo. Who in South Africa, maybe 20 elderly speakers, reclamation efforts started some time ago. And now the language is taught in schools and there are trilingual readers for Gu, Afrikaans and English. Torwali in Northern Pakistan. It looks like a lot of speakers, 80,000 to 100,000, but the language is being replaced by Urdu and Pashto. Uh, reclamation efforts are being made by, led by community organizations and a linguist, uh, Zubair Torwali, who by his name, I imagine is probably a member of the community. So how can linguists help? Uh, what linguists cannot do is save endangered languages. Only communities can do that. But linguists can be useful to communities if the communities want their help by documenting the languages while there's still time, while they're still fluent speakers, and by helping to prepare teaching materials. A couple of examples. Here's a very early example. I, I should maybe apologize for having so many examples from the United States. Uh, it's not um, it's not because I think that's where all the interesting cases are. It's just that I'm a specialist in Native American languages, and so those are the ones I know. Um, 
So this early example, the Meskwaki Papa Pipo. Um, in 1911, the anthropological linguist Truman Michelson visited the Meskwaki settlement in Iowa and discovered that everybody there was literate in their own writing system, Pape Pipo. It doesn't look anything like the English alphabet or like any other alphabet or syllabary. And in fact, basically it is a syllabary, not an alphabet. Um, and they all knew it. It's very easy to learn apparently. He paid them pennies per page. He paid speakers in the settlement pennies per page to write whatever they wanted to write. And they did. They wrote hunting stories, war stories, winter stories, autobiographies, and all sorts of other things, literature. They wrote a total of 26,000 pages. This is an unparalleled corpus of Native American writing written by native speakers who at the time were not fluent in English. This was before they were probably multilingual in other Native American languages. Uh, other Algonquian languages or Siouan languages, um, but this was before the people were acculturated to Anglo society. And it's now a major resource for reclamation of the Meskwaki language, which on the UNESCO scale is critically endangered. A somewhat more recent example uh, from late in the 20th century, um, there are comments by a couple of cow speakers in an obituary in the Wichita Eagle newspaper uh, for the uh, linguist Robert Rankin. One of them said, if it wasn't for his work, we wouldn't have our language. He single-handed preserved our language. You can't put a price on something like that. And the other one, uh, this is Johnny McCauley, um, who was one of the last speakers of cow. He said, I just want to hear it again. There's been no one else to talk it with. Um, Rankin made CDs of the language uh, that he recorded um, with Macaulay's aunt, late aunt. And Macaulay died in his home a few months after receiving the CDs. And when he was found in his home, the CD recordings of his late aunt speaking the family's native Cal Indian language were still playing according to that obituary. Uh, that quote is, as I say from the obituary, uh, Rankin had recorded the stories on reel-to-reel -reel tapes, ancient technology in the 1970s. He digitized and converted the tapes to CDs in 1996 and presented the Cal community with a set of the CDs that same year. Let me say a little more about the Master Apprentice Language Learning Program, which I mentioned earlier. This one is especially widespread and successful. It was devised by the University of California at Berkeley linguist Leanne Hinton. Um, the basic principle is one learner is paired with one fluent elder. Uh, they work together, the members of the same Native American tribe or wherever. This, this uh, program has been imported to various countries in the world. They, uh, they, they're trained to, in the work, so they know what they're, you know, how to, how to do it. Um, they don't have to just figure it all out for themselves. And they work together to help the learner learn the language. This is especially useful as a means of reclamation in a community where there's only a handful of remaining fluent speakers left and, um, and there are young, tribal members eager to learn the language. In many communities, linguists do help with the development of teaching materials for language classes, but there's a problem. Uh, in the United States, at least, I honestly don't know whether this is true in the rest of the world as well, but in the United States, linguists are rarely trained in applied linguistics. Uh, we don't usually have the skills that are needed to develop effective um, effective teaching materials. Um, there is a potential solution. Uh, training in applied linguistics could be included in graduate linguistics programs. I don't think this is likely to happen anytime soon in American universities, but perhaps because uh, documentary linguistics is gaining in popularity and spread, uh, perhaps it will um, occur to people that they need this kind of training and this will change. 
not all linguists lack the necessary background in language teaching. Uh, there's a linguist in the United States named Ari Sheris, who has uh, extensive training in both applied and, and non-applied linguistics. Uh, and he's done a lot of work, um, pedagogically oriented work. Here are two books that he co-edited uh, in 2019 one, Rejecting Marginalized Status of Minority Languages, Educational Projects and Curricula, Pushing Back Against Language Endangerment, and the other one, Teaching Writing to Children in Indigenous Languages, Instructional Practices from Global Context. So there are linguists who do have the right training and who are able to help. So you've got both um, language teaching orientation and documentation. My own experience has been almost entirely combined, confined to documentation because I am not one of those linguists who have language teaching skills. Um, but my career has been bracketed by documentation on work on endangered languages. Um, I started out when I was a beginner working on a set of endangered dialects. And for the past 40 summers, I've worked with elders in the Flathead Reservation in Montana, United States, on the Salish Kitlispe language. I began in the former Yugoslavia when it was a big country uh, with a year of dissertation research and field work on endangered dialects of the language, which at the time was known as Serbo-Croatian. Now there is no such language as Serbo-Croatian. There are four separate languages, Serbian, Croatian, Bosnian, and Montenegrin. But there was only one language then with mutually intelligible dialects. The dialects I studied are almost certainly gone by now. Uh, the villages I visited um, had young people who spoke standard server creation, but the speakers I worked with were in their 60s or older and had never been to school. In those days, this was in the mid 1960s, um, there were a lot of people of that age group and older who had not been to school which meant that they were unable to switch to the standard dialect. When I was talking to them, I was speaking the standard dialect because that was the only one I knew, um, but they were not. It was my dissertation research. It didn't turn out to be a good dissertation. There were a few interesting bits. There was a noun forming suffix, for instance, ulya, and it derived pejorative nouns for women and non-pejorative names for cows in certain dialects of the Shokavian dialect group. So you had things like nosulia, nos is the word for nose, a woman with a big ugly nose. You had glibulia, a filthy woman, but then you had mrkulia, a dark colored cow, and sivulia, a gray cow. Um, I never discovered the linkage between um, negative terms for women and non-negative terms for cows. Um, I don't know what the cultural connection was, but the words were very interesting. Field work I did then wasn't always easy. I had to sign in in each village with the local communist official. I have to say they were always very pleasant to me and helpful. Uh, I had to find speakers who couldn't switch to standard server creation and they had to be women because I found it was not culturally appropriate for me or any other woman to question a man. The men would talk to me, but they wouldn't answer questions. And there were incidents. There was a hillside in Montenegro um, overlooking the Skadarsko Jezero and Albania. And I was trying to interview a woman who was herding sheep on that hillside and she wouldn't talk to me because she was afraid I was from the Yugoslav secret police. It wasn't a successful field site. Um, and on the island Krk in the village of Dobrin, I found an excellent uh, speaker of the local Chakavian dialect, a woman, but her husband had been in the American merchant marine for years and his English was very fluent and he wanted to tell me all about it in English. Uh, and I couldn't talk to his wife when he was there because it also wasn't appropriate for the woman to talk when her husband was there. So I would walk to their house and hide behind the stone fence across the road until I saw her husband leave to go to work um, in the village. And then I could go interview the wife. Field work in Montana has been easier in most ways. For one thing, there's less cultural difference between me and the elders I've worked with. It was easy to collect a group of fluent elders. Um, 
under the auspices of the Salish Kutlispeh Culture Committee, but it was hard to find out what the Culture Committee would like me to do. I was eager to do whatever would be most helpful, um, but for whatever reason, probably because of politeness, they didn't really want to tell me. So I made a couple of wrong guesses until I finally discovered that they were very happy with a dictionary project. So that's what I mostly worked on. I met with elders every week and we had a lot of fun. I think they had fun and so did I. And we, there was a lot of laughter, mostly at my mistakes uh, in their language, but that was fun. I found it hard to guess which words might be taboo because the cultural rules for taboo words were not the same as for English and I didn't want to say anything inappropriate. And I found that getting information about medicinal plants was difficult because I was told the medicines wouldn't work if outsiders got access to the information. They nevertheless told me a lot of things about medicinal plants and I don't know what to do about them because if I put them in the dictionary, I might keep the medicines from being effective. So there were issues. There are always issues in field work. Um, it's well worth it, but there are always issues. Every summer since 1981, I've worked with the elders on the Flathead Reservation. So I say mostly compiling a dictionary, but also a set of texts for their language program. Um, all the elders I've worked with for so many years have died mostly in the past six years. And that's why when I'm talking about my field work, a lot of it is in the past tense. And it is tragic for the community to lose these wonderful people and tragic for me because I, I grew to love them. Let me introduce, I wanna tell you more about my documentary work in Montana, but let me tell you a little more about the tribes and their language. Um, Salish Kutlispeh is the names, the self names of the two tribes, Salish and the Kutlispeh. Uh, uh, in the past, they've been called Montana Salish or Salish Pandare or Flathead. Flathead is the name first appears in the literature uh, designating these people and actually only the Salish, not the Kutlispeh. It's a gravely endangered language, only a handful of fluent speakers left, very, very few now, all of them quite elderly. All of these elders are survivors of school systems, mostly Catholic boarding schools, but also public schools in which they were beaten for speaking their language. And as a result, their own children did not learn the language because they didn't want their children to go through what they'd gone through. The Salish and Kutlispeh are two different tribes. They share a reservation. There may in the past have been systematic dialect differences, but I have not been able to find any. I think their dialects are no longer differentiated. There are other two other tribes, the Spokans and the Kalispells, who speak dialects of the same language, but there's no name for the whole language. Four tribes, three reservations, one language. And all four tribes are longtime allies in. Um, uh, resisting encroachment by uh, hostile tribes, mainly the Blackfeet. Uh, Salish Kutlispe is a member of the Southern Interior branch of the Salish and language family. It's the easternmost of the 23 languages of the family. Most of them are spoken on or near the Pacific coast, or they were, uh, some of them are already gone. Um, the Kutlispe have in recorded history, been at home on what is now the Flathead Reservation. The Salish were at home in the Bitterroot Valley, which is south of the reservation, south of Missoula, Montana, for those of you who are familiar with the geography of Montana. But they were forced in the 1870s to move to the Flathead Reservation, to the southern part. So both tribes occupy the southern half of the reservation, the northern half is the home of the Kootenai tribe. Kootenai is um, a language that's not related to Salish and or to any other languages, as far as anybody knows, um, also gravely endangered. 1805 uh, is the first recorded meeting between the Salish people, uh, not the Kalispe, but the Salish people and white people. Um, and actually there was also an African-American in the Lewis and Clark expedition. Um, 
there were certainly white people there, Europeans there um, before that, uh, fur traders, fur, fur hunters um, from Quebec mainly. 1841 was the founding of the first mission in Salish territory. Uh, 1845, the mission moved to Eastern Washington state, wasn't a state then. 1854, the mission moved to St. Ignatius and that's where it currently is, the church. 1855, the reservation was established by the Hellgate Treaty. The last chief recognized by the US government was Charlotte. Case, which was his naming small grizzly bear claws, was his self name. In 1909, Congress decided that the reservation should be open to whites uh, who bought up a lot of the land on the reservation. And the people were hunters and gatherers until um, they couldn't do that anymore because there were too many white people around and not enough game. They hunted buffalo. They went to the plains every year, east through the Rocky Mountains. Their, their reservation is in the Rocky Mountains, but they went to the plains to hunt buffalo. And they joined with other small tribes to do this, the Spokane, Skalaspels, Kootenays, Nez Perce, and others to resist, avoid harassment by the powerful Blackfoot tribe. And then jump forward to 2001, John Peter Paul died. Uh, he was Kutlispe, his wife Agnes Poker Jim Paul was Salish, and they were the last couple and family to speak Salish Kutlispe as their home language. So um, doing field work on an endangered language, uh, you first make contacts, you get permission to work with elders, you plan your day-to-day -day work, you plan your week-to-week -week work. I've always found it very useful to work with a group of elders. For one thing, you get to hear them speak the language to each other. They jog each other's memory. One person can't remember a word, but the other person might. Uh, you get both men's perspectives and women's perspectives. And I discovered several years ago, they told me it was these meetings with me during the summer were their only chance to speak their language now. Um, and there were some elders meetings at the culture center during, uh, during the rest of the year. Uh, but they all lived in, most of them lived in multi-generational families, but they were the only ones in the family to speak the language, so they didn't speak it at home. They only spoke it with each other, and they didn't get together very often. That made me feel useful, that I gave them that opportunity. When you're working with an endangered language, if it's really seriously endangered, you have to expect a great deal of individual variation, and you have to try to distinguish attrition, which is due to gradual language death with things getting lost and not replaced from the language from ordinary variation that occurs in every language in the world. Um, and you get conflicting judgments of speakers. So one speaker says something and other ones, you can't say that, then, then they don't agree. Uh, and your goal throughout is to get people to retrieve language memories to think about their language in ways that they haven't ever thought about it and certainly haven't thought about it for years. Some people are better at this than others, naturally. There's no perfect consultant or any perfect people. Um, but it's interesting to see how that works when you're working with a group where they, as I say, jog each other's memories. The first steps, if you're starting from scratch, you know nothing about the language, you need to get some basic words, some morphological paradigms, some simple sentence types, work out a phonemic system so that you can spell the words uh, easily, a template for word structure, a general overall picture of the grammar. Um, and importantly, you wanna find out what the community wants you to work on and then you work on that because you're working in the service of the community, not for yourself. Uh, as I say, I finally discovered after some trial and error that the Salish Culture Committee wanted me to work on a dictionary. So that's what I did. Um, and let me talk about that for a bit. How do you get data for a dictionary? Well, you want to start with words as short as possible. Uh, Salish Kutlispe, like the other Salish and languages, is very highly polysynthetic, so words are very long. 
but there are some short words. You get the shortest ones you can so that you can do initial phonetic and phonological analysis and initial morphological elicitation. I see John, I, you see John, she sees John, that sort of thing. But using a name more appropriate than John. Later on, uh, you wanna get lots and lots of words for compiling a dictionary and you wanna document culturally relevant terms and concepts. So if you're making a dictionary, how many words are enough? Michael Krauss, a linguist who's, who worked um, for many years on Athabascan languages uh, and some related languages, uh, thought that 6,000 words was enough for a moribund language, that is a language that's no longer being learned by children as a first language, and 14,000 for a non-moribund language. Terry Kaufman, who worked for many decades on languages of uh, indigenous languages of Mesoamerica, thought 400 to 6, 4,000 to 6,000 words would be a good minimum. 10,000 would be a maximum. I have maximum in quotation marks because you can never have too many words. But if you want to move from one language to another, you could stop at 10,000. So obviously, these figures are arbitrary, but it gives you some idea of the scope if you want to do serious documentation. Uh, my problem has always been that I can't force myself to stop collecting new words so that my dictionary files are full of 40 years of inconsistencies because I have learned a lot more about the language as time has gone on. And instead of repairing the dictionary files, I've gotten new words. I can't do that anymore though. Uh, completeness is never a realistic goal. Every human language, natural human language, has um, tens of thousands of words. Uh, so, you know, 10,000 even is still a drop in the bucket. How do you think of words to ask for? Well, what you don't do is go to meet with a group of elders and sit there and try to think of words to ask for. You prepare for every meeting with the elders. You make sure you have enough material for more than the time you'll have. And you also don't take a monolingual dictionary of your own language, for instance, English, uh, and start working through that, beginning with the first letter. If you did that in English, you'd get words like a, aardvark, and aardwolf, and this would really not help you document any indigenous language um, anywhere except possibly uh, certain languages of South Africa. But even then, the a at the very beginning would be a bad idea. So you want to start with some basic vocabulary and the 200 word list devised by Morris Swadesh for a somewhat different purpose of vocabulary items that are supposed to occur in every language in, a world, in the world is a good place to start. Gives you a sizable stock of words as short as possible. Um, and as I say, you can use those to start working on figuring out the language's structure. You accept all the words the speakers give you. The Swadesh list is supposed to be universal, but of course it's not because languages differ from each other. Um, and a lot of languages, one of the words on that list is brother. English has one word for brother, uh, but a lot of languages don't have a single word meaning any kind of brother. Uh, and Salish Kutlispe is one of those languages. So you get younger brothers, Sintse, and older brother, Kheos. And um, you, they might have a lot of different words for horse. And they say, well, which one do you want? You say all of them. And so you get some ska, um, meaning roughly uh, a domestic elk, or chtsin, meaning uh, something that bites for biting grass. But there are other words on that list that they don't have a word for. And you, there's nothing sacred about the list. You just move on to the next word. You also make use of any available sources and techniques uh, you can. Um, one technique that's been used uh, with great success by uh, SIL international uh, field workers uh, is to have sheets of paper with different semantic domains on them, body parts, kin terms, animal names, and give them to groups of, you know, have a group of people, maybe two or three people in a group and give them a domain and have them think of all the words they can in that domain. 
Uh, and then when they finish that, you give that one to another group and you to start all to start and then you give this first group a different domain. This works quite well. I've actually tried it in uh, undergraduate field methods class where I told them to, you know, I put them in groups and I said, think of a somatic domain and then think of all the words you can. It worked very well. Uh, the problem if you're doing this with an endangered language is that some domains, some semantic domains are already partly lost because people don't talk about that anymore. Um, direct elicitation can also get you to culturally and linguistically interesting things like sound symbolism, a, a domain. Uh, in Salish Kitlispe, I have words like the sound of cow poop plopping, the creaking sound a tree makes when it's starting to fall, little shiny things sparkling like stars winking or sequins on a jingle dress. You can get some cultural items. So you get uh, sound and sight imitation. That's a particular formation that I, that I like a lot. Um, and you can get dozens of them. Uh, you can use open-ended follow-up questions. So like, are there any other words for sounds or sights that I haven't asked for yet? And they'll say, well, yeah, there's e, but a little, 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 which is a bunch of things going in and out of vision. Like when you see running horses through a picket fence. You wanna get naturally occurring data as well uh, from recorded storytelling, reminiscences of old active, traditional activities, whatever. Um, these are vital because there will be many, many words that you will not get from elicitation. You won't think to ask for them and your consultants won't happen to think of them out of context. Um, what this means is that you can't compile an adequate dictionary by focusing only on collecting words. You also have to collect texts of as many kinds as possible. You can use constructed texts also, um, either elicited sentence by sentence translation or elicited by what happens next uh, questions. I've used both of these, uh, the sentence by sentence translations, mostly to get examples of rarely occurring grammatical features like second person plural agent acting on first person plural patient or vice versa. And the latter with what happens next prompts to get descriptions of traditional activities like processing deer hides and baking camas, which is a staple root crop. You can look in published sources on the same language or on related languages or on nearby unrelated languages to get more ideas about words to ask for. Uh, for my work, important sources have been dictionaries of Spokane, which as I say, is a dialect of the same language as Salish Kutlispe, uh, and of Colville Okanagan, which is close geographically and closely related to Salish Kutlispe. But my most useful source by far has been a 19th century, late 19th century dictionary compiled by Jesuit missionaries, uh, a huge dictionary, two volumes, a thousand pages, Kalispell English and English Kalispell. They say Kalispell, but it's actually Salish Kutlispell. The um, dictionary includes an appendix with some grammatical information. Um, the authorship is not entirely clear. The name on the dictionary is the Reverend J. Jorda, but it's pretty clear that Father Gregory Mangarini uh, began compiling this dictionary when he was at the mission at St. Mary's in the Bitterroot Valley among the Salish people. Uh, about 20 years, 25 years before the dictionary was published. In any case, there are more than 700 main entries in the Salish English volume, many with dozens of subentries. It's a very, very rich source of material, lexical material. It's also hard to use. The orthography is under differentiated. Um, for instance, the letters, the sequence KO is used to represent three different phonemes, ko, Ko and ko. Also, some of the forms in the dictionary are very rare, possibly lost completely. And you can't tell 
um, whether if the elders don't recognize the form, you can't tell whether that's because the form used to be in the language and has been lost or whether it's a mistake. There are certainly mistakes in any, um, any work as large as this dictionary. So I've spent, I spent the last 15, 10, 15, maybe even 20 years of my field work um, re-eliciting material from that Jesuit dictionary. Um, and it was a really interesting process, I would say. So the Father's Dictionary has a word, uh, something like chun chemist. I join my hands together to receive something. Do you have that word? And they say, no, never heard that. And I say, well, then how would you say that? And they'd say, we'd say chun tikshtum, like you open your hands to receive something. So you didn't get the word the Jesuits had, but you get a good word. Or I'd say the fathers have eschisti, he's exploring. Do you have that word? And I say, yeah, we have that word. It's eschisti, but it means he goes into enemy country to scout. So again, you get cultural information that the Jesuits didn't have, or at least that they didn't put in the dictionary. Whatever technique you're using, you want to encourage the elders to um, free associate. So I said, so the fathers have eschatus, eyes could be screened off. I don't even know what that means. Um, I have no idea what it was supposed to mean. And neither did they, they didn't recognize it, but they say, well, no, but there's a similar word. There's instutus, the opponent, like in a stick game. Stick game is a traditional gambling game. Or I'd say the fathers have an us, a narrow hole, like in a needle. And they'd say, say, Amanula, there are people in the waiting room. Do you see them? Yes, I admitted them. Got them? Okay. Um, oops. Uh, and they didn't have, they didn't have uh, an us, but they had no, what we say, essent us, which is obviously related for the eye of a needle. Then they say, well, and then there's also es, but oops, a flat butt, and that makes them laugh. As I say, we did a lot of laughing. You do have to be aware of verbal taboos, things that are taboo in English might not be taboo in their language, but you do have to be careful. Once they gave me a word, and they said it means moving around invisibly under something. And one of them added, yeah, it's like getting nasty under the blanket. Well, they didn't think that was so taboo. But a couple of other things that didn't seem at all taboo to me were seriously taboo, mostly things connected with their traditional religion, pre-Catholic. Um, semantic domains can be large, like sound symbolism, or small, like ways of walking. An important thing to keep in mind if you're doing documentary work or if you're starting to do it is that the task is very different at the beginning of a project when almost every word is new. And at the end, later on, when you have an awful lot of words and free associating just ends up being very repetitive and a waste of everybody's time. And of course, you're never going to tell people that you don't want a word because that might offend them. There aren't a lot of cultural insights that you get directly or that I get directly from the Jesuit dictionary. Um, and most of the ones you do get are, are negative, many of them anyway. Um, there are obscene terms in the dictionary and I assume they're obscene because instead of having meanings in English, uh, like most of the other words, um, the meanings are in Latin. I wonder if these are from the confessional. Some of them I never could translate because um, my Latin dictionary didn't have the words and the elders wouldn't tell me what they meant. But not always, as I say, taboo is not, is not predictable from language to language. So um, there's a word that I found in the Jesuit dictionary and the elders had it. They said, nsh, nsh, oopsen. And they laughed and wouldn't tell me what it meant. I believe, judging by the pieces, that it means I have sex with her. But um, I can't prove that because they wouldn't tell me. And then there are priest words in the dictionary. Um, like uh, uh, and the priests, the 
Jesuit dictionary says it means I think myself heavy and the elders say it's like lifting a spiritual burden, kind of a priest word. They were kind of dismissive about the priest words. Uh, the idea I assume was that they were made up by the priests and um, uh, the community members never found them particularly appealing as words in their language. Um, very often, uh, the dictionary would trigger memories of very old words, words that the elders had heard from their grandparents, uh, like uh, and the Jesuits said that that was your hope, your help that someone gave you and you relied on. And an elder said, well, one elder said a priest would say that, so you'd rely on him for support. And another elder said, well, they said it before the priest too, like in winter. They had something they relied on, their medicine, their sweat. Sweats is in the sweat lodges. Um, so to get back from experience with a linguist trying to help a community with personal anecdotes, um, to get back to the, to the general issue of linguists in the community. Um, the most important question perhaps, or at least the answer to it is, do outside linguists have the right to tell a community what their language should be like? And the answer is, of course they don't. Uh, and why would I even suggest it? Well, this can be painful for the linguist because if a process of reclamation is successful, it will inevitably result in a language variety that differs considerably from the language as it was spoken by fluent first language speakers. And linguists tend very strongly to be interested in the older form because it's more likely to have um, interesting linguistic things that they've never seen before. Uh, so for Salish Kutlispe, I can predict with considerable confidence that all four of their pharyngeal consonants will disappear soon with their successful reclamation efforts. Um, for one thing, these consonants are not part of the official writing system. They're hard to hear. They're phonetically unstable. Uh, 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 and uh. Um, some speakers I've worked with didn't have them at all, but uh, some elders did, all those elders are gone now. Uh, at least some of the elaborate consonant clusters may disappear. Uh, don't play with that or someone whose job it is to take care of livestock. And there are a couple of features in this language that as far as I know are unique to this language. Uh, uh, one of them doesn't even occur in one of the dialects of the same language spoken by a neighboring tribe. One is the pattern of sound symbolism I already mentioned with the four consonants, so the second consonant of the root repeated three times. Uh, the other one is a truncation rule. It goes like this, uh, delete everything after the accented vowel if you want to, but you won't want to if there are crucial suffixes after that vowel. So for instance, sene is a word for a cow elk. It's shortened from sene. And the only reason I know that is that one of the other dialects of this nameless language has the full form, but not the short form. And one of the words for horse I mentioned before, uh is shortened from sene. Outside linguists, People who are not members of the community, like me when I'm working with Salish Kutlispe elders, have to be extremely careful to ensure that we're showing proper respect in working with the elders in the community. And as I say, you ask permission before you try to work with fluent speakers. You never suggest to a speaker or a member of the community that they know less about their language than you do. And you don't publish anything about the language without first getting permission from the community. Um, but most of those difficulties will go away if the linguist doing the documentation work and, the, and developing teaching materials is a member of the community rather than the outsider. 
This is a very powerful argument in favor of providing training in linguistics for interested community members, um, but it's not done enough. <laughs> Um, one hopes that it will grow uh, in frequency. This is especially important in a community that has good reason to be suspicious of outsiders, particularly including outside linguists. Uh, and that means all Native American communities in the United States who have been uh, mistreated so severely by Anglo culture that uh, they really would often rather not see linguists or anthropologists or any other scholars come into their communities. And a lot of communities elsewhere in the world as well. Americans are unpopular in a lot of places, but it's not just Americans. Um, this will happen with uh, people from universities in a lot of countries. Um, in any case, the most important for lesson for a linguist to learn, especially an outside linguist is humility. Of course, you hope your efforts are going to be useful to the community, um, but the documentation you do, although it's important, is a tool for revitalization. It may not be a valid goal in itself at all from the community's perspective. Um, it's a form of preservation, and from the community's perspective, preservation is not what they're aiming for when they want to reclaim their language. So I'll close with a quotation from the Clinkett oral historians, um, members of the Clinkett nation, Nora Marks Dauenhauer and Richard Dauenhauer. Preservation, they said, is what we do to berries and jam jars and salmon and cans. Preserved foods are different from thriving berry patches and surging runs of salmon and dictionaries are not the same as speech. Books and recordings can preserve languages, but only people in communities can keep them alive. Thank you. Thank you so, so very much, Professor Sally, for this wonderful talk and for uh, uh, sharing your experience and uh, all these uh, wonderful anecdotes. So, yeah, now the floor is open for questions and answers session. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat. I'm seeing there's a question. Uh, what does uh, language revitalization, uh, revitalization really involve? What do you really mean by revitalization, uh, revitalizing an endangered language? To what extent do you really believe in the revitalization of an endangered language at the edge of globalization and the spread of social media where English is imposing itself as a global language? So your thoughts on it? Wow. Um, <laughs> that's, a, that's a huge question. If I got this right, you want to know? At, at this point, you have to speak very slowly and loudly because I, I'm, it's, it's midnight here and I'm no longer fully awake. Um, but you're interested in what I think an endangered language is? Yeah. Actually, this question has political overtones and I'm not good at politics. Uh, I find the, I find the, ah, the answer to that question that just appeared on the screen is yes, that's interesting. Um, I find the UNESCO scale usable uh, with vulnerable, definitely endangered, severely endangered, critically endangered. Uh, Obviously, there's going to be there are going to be um, fuzzy boundaries between those categories. I mean, what counts as severely endangered or critically endangered? You can say it has 20 native speakers as opposed to two native speakers. I mean, wherever you place the boundary, it's going to be debatable. But at least at least it gives you a very rough notion of where you are. And I didn't mention that the UNESCO scale also has a category extinct. Um, and a question that just appeared on the screen was, what do you do if the language, you know, can you revive a language that has no speakers left? Um, and the answer is yes. There are various programs out there for communities trying to revive languages that are no longer spoken. You can't do it unless you have some kind of documentation from when it was spoken. The 
most discussed example um, is the Wampanoag uh, case that I know of, is the Wampanoag case in, in, um, on the East Coast of the United States. It's an Algonquian language and its last speakers, last native speakers died about a hundred years ago. Uh, but, um, but there is a vigorous program to bring the language back because there was a lot of documentation. Some people might say Hebrew is such a case. Hebrew never disappeared entirely. It was always used for religious purposes. And in the 2000 years of, of, of not being spoken as a day-to-day -day community language. And it was also used to discuss high scholarly topics um, by people whose native language was not Hebrew, but it was not a language of everyday life. And it was revived. The circumstances of the revival of Hebrew are unique for various reasons. The most significant ones are that um, it's the language of a major world religion, the sacred language of a major world religion. And secondly, in the early days of Israel, uh, modern Israel, um, Children were put in kibbutzes and brought up in kibbutzes and Hebrew was the language uh, that was used with them. Well, if you, don't have, if you don't have the cultural power of a major religion and you don't have actual government that has the authority to say, okay, the kids are gonna be raised with this language um, and you have a country of refugees, um, it's going to be a lot harder, but there are, there are impressive steps being taken to revive um, Wampanoag and other languages that are no longer spoken. Sorry, did I get off the subject, uh, Amanula? Was, there was more to the question about how I would define a, an endangered language. You know, it also yeah. depends, when I said political, it depends on the community's view. How does the community feel about their language? If they don't like the thought that it's endangered, maybe they feel that they have quite a few speakers and the language is alive. They're the experts. Yeah. So that leads me to my next question, which is from Mohammed Hussein from the University of Laura Live, Balochistan. And he asked how we would come to know that a language is endangered. What is the minimum number of speakers, you say? Uh, the number of speakers is relevant, but what's more relevant is um, who's learning it. If children are not learning it as a first language, the language is in trouble, no matter how many speakers there are. I mean, Navajo, um, a few gen very few generations ago had 150,000 speakers. And for a Native American language of the United States, that's a huge number. And then that number just plummeted over the course of two generations um, because kids went to school outside the reservation. I mean, there were various factors. Uh, English, is, English is so powerful in the United States um, that it's hard to avoid it. Uh, so even, I mean, 100,000 speakers, that's a lot of speakers. Um, but if the kids aren't learning it as a first language, then your chances of keeping it going are relatively slim, which is why um, so much effort is, is devoted in, in language revitalization programs to getting the language into the schools so the kids can get exposed to it early. Earlier is better. There's the language nest program that was developed in New Zealand for Maori and then exported to Hawaii for Hawaiian, where you get preschool kids in groups where the, you know, in, in a preschool where the only language that's spoken to them is the one you're trying to revitalize. Hmm, great. So this is the question from Manzuru Sen and from Skardu. He says, I'm working on Balti language and script. And he asks, what is the proper way to save and promote endangered languages? Uh, 
you know, that is a political question too. And I, I, I think the chances of um, getting a situation, anything like modern Hebrew are slim to none for maybe all, but at all, but a tiny handful of endangered languages. Um, I think though that all these hundreds of revitalization programs are keeping the language alive in the community, even if the language isn't restored to day-to-day, -day, you know, everybody's speaking it every day. Even without that, the fact that people are working on revitalizing it and valuing it, that helps the community retain that um, vital link to their traditional culture. And they're, you know, I'm, I'm a linguist. I, I'm not a very interdisciplinary person, but there are health benefits to that kind of linkage. So it depends, you need to say, you need to think about what you mean by success. If your goal is the situation with Hebrew, that's not realistic, but there are other goals that are realistic successes uh, without getting to something as extreme as Hebrew. Great. So and worth pursuing. Mm -hmm. uh, this one is from Diana Rose from Indonesia, and she asks, "I'm interested to write a doctoral propose, uh, proposal regarding endangered languages in Indonesia." Uh, please give me advice. Where do I start? Advice about Indonesia? <laughs> uh, yes, about endangered languages. What should be the starting point for her? Well, first you have to find out what the endangered languages are. And there are a lot of them in Indonesia. I mean, first of all, Indonesia has a huge number of languages. I don't know if it's true that most of them endangered, but I know an awful lot of them are. Um, I had a student in an endangered languages seminar last term who came from a Batak community and he didn't speak his heritage language. Uh, and he was concerned to see how it could be, how it could be revitalized. Uh, so first of all, if you're a member of the community, that's the community you work with. And that's great. If you're a teacher, and you have, and you particularly, if you're a teacher who knows how to teach languages and develop teaching materials, and you have students who come from communities of endangered languages, um, then you can work with those students and you can help them. If you're not in either of those positions, but you're a trained linguist and you want to do something useful for community with an endangered language, you find such a community Try to, try to make contact, see if they would welcome the help of a linguist and um, work with them. So the, the, the starting point differs depending on your background and training, your, the time you have available, uh, what the community wants, what you have access to, students from the community, from endangered language communities that you could work with, or going directly to the communities themselves. There are a lot of starting points um, and it's good work. It's also fun. Great, so I see this question from Mahmoud and he asks, does the dominating languages in any region generally used for communication, business or other purposes, are they responsible for diminishing a local dialect? Ah. Uh, Endangered dialects as opposed to endangered languages, you mean? You know, that's one of uh, the, did I get that wrong? Well, he says the dominating languages in any region, are they responsible for diminishing the marginalized when a marginalized, you know, diminishing local dialects? Yeah, this is, I don't know about responsible, but this is, 
this is a problem I didn't talk about, but if you're going to revitalize um, an endangered language, so here, here you are in a country where you've got an endangered language and you want to work on revitalizing it, and it has various dialects. In order to pursue your goals, it's you're really going to have to do some standardization. If you want to produce teaching materials, you've got to write them. Um, and what dialect do you choose to write them in? You can't realistically, for fun, you know, for financial reasons and other practical reasons, expect to write teaching materials in a whole bunch of different dialects of this language. And whatever dialect you pick, the other dialects will suffer, potentially anyway. Um, I, I was corresponding for some time with a, a young woman who was working in, I can't remember, it was somewhere in Southeast Asia. Laos or Vietnam, I can't remember which country. And she was, she was actually trying to compile a dictionary that included dialect information. So try to do revitalization without raising one dialect and submerging others. But it's difficult because particularly when you think of the educational system, because you have to choose particular things to teach. And you can't teach a whole bunch of different dialects without confusing students, I don't think. But of course, I'm not a language teacher. So there are, I hope, people cleverer than I am who have dealt with this. In any case, there are a lot of case studies. Um, Scots Gaelic, Breton in France, uh, those are Celtic languages, but there are others too where one dialect is chosen and then people don't feel connected to it if they speak another dialect. And dialects often come with cultural baggage too. So if I have a dialect and it's part of my culture and you're telling me I should learn your dialect instead, I'm not gonna be very happy. And there are cases where people in Scotland where people say, yeah, I'd rather just go to English because they're all bilingual anyway. And if they don't like the dialect chosen for Gaelic, then they might as well just speak English. This is very unfortunate. I don't know if there's a solution. I don't right, want to be pessimistic. <laughs> yeah, maybe this one, a last question from Abdullah. Yes, yeah. does quantitative self-reported data reveal as much about the degree of endangered merit of a given threatened variety? Say that again slower. <laughs> yeah, so he says, does quantitative self-reported data reveal as much about the degree of endangerment of a given threatened variety? Uh, well, as I say, any, any classification by speaker numbers has got to be very rough. I mean, any, any classification, any, any scale. I don't think you can, I don't think degree of endangerment is something you can pin down to precision because to a large extent, if I'm understanding the question right, to so, it depends so much on how the speech, how the community members feel about it. That is, they might agree that it's in danger, but it's not that endangered. Or, you know, our language has disappeared, we've got to do something. I mean, you, you can't discount points of view. It's not, it's, um, I don't know if I should go so far as to say it's not a scientific question. Degree of endangerment is to a large extent, I think, subjective. I could have said that much more slowly if I weren't so tired. <laughs> Yeah, thanks much very much, uh, Professor Sally. And any final message on the eve of International Mother Language Day webinar series to our audience? Yeah, thank you again. Thank you for inviting me. I've really enjoyed this. I'm sorry I didn't get to all the questions in the um, uh, chat.
And the last comment was that UNESCO has developed criteria for degree of endangerment. I believe it. I think it's fine to develop criteria. All I'm saying is it's still going to be subjective to a considerable extent. Thanks very much, Professor Sally. I really appreciate it. I know it's too late for you at Michigan, but yeah, you know, the work, your dedication and passion really is a lot about your work. So yeah, really appreciate your presence here at my webinar. Thank you very much, uh, everyone, for your presence here. And uh, if you're interested to share this recording, it will be placed on Data Development Webinar's YouTube channel. So you can share with your colleagues who are interested. For future webinars, you can follow our uh, website, www.pdwebinars.org. And all of our social media channels are available on, on Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook. So if you want a certificate for this particular session, you can contact at info.pdwebinars at the rate of gmail.com. Thank you very much, Professor Sarah Thompson, once again. We really appreciate your presence here.